Hi everyone, I'm India. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford, supervised by David and Patrick. Um, and I, yeah, I'm going to be talking about redefining the finite element using um, ideas from group theory. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well. I think you were in the wrong paging mode. It was in presentation mode when I left. If it's not now. <laughs> <laughs> Single page. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Now tell it to stop automatically advancing and you're going to get very frustrated. What? It's going what's to the pause button where it's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not that one. What? That this one? one? That one? Yep. Oh my god, now, okay. Now you can go back to where you want to. <laughs> sorry for the chaos. It's not letting me use my buttons. Uh, click on the things. Yeah. Cool, okay. okay. Yeah. Cool, great. Okay, well, this is the content of the course. We can skip that slide. <laughs> Um, so, to redefine the finite element, we need to look up the original definition. So, historically, we've used Cyrillet's definition of a finite element, the KVL triple, where you have the cell, a bound and closed subset of Rn, um, V, the suitable finite dimensional space, and L, the set of degrees of freedom, which forms the basis of V, um, with the V star. So, we are going to essentially build on Cyrillet's definition to ensure that um, it contains all the required information to implement the finite element method. Because currently, although Cyrillet provides a lot of the information required, you actually need to make some inherent assumptions in order to put that into practice. So a key example of um, these, uh, this implicit assumption is the association of degrees of freedom to uh, topological entities of the cell. So, um, and, then, and then the um, convention that if a degree of freedom is associated with the same entity of a cell in a mesh, it needs to have the same value from both um, elements. So that, that topological assumption is like not mentioned at all in um, Cyrillet's definition, basically. And that means that if you just look at the degrees of freedom for a CG1 element and a DG1 element, you get exactly the same thing. Um, because you can see here for CG1, they're associated with the vertices and therefore shared across the mesh, um, enforcing continuity. But for DG1, they're not, for no continuity. And there are a few other things that, while we're redefining it, we think it's really useful to look to include in a new definition. So this is um, the observation that most elements have some sort of inherent symmetry when you're constructing them, and how can we include that information and utilise that information in the, um, in the definition. Uh, we also kind of, as a um, consequence of this, we aren't able to reason about the orientation of an element even when this is necessary to match up DOFs across a mesh. Um, so that's a factor we want to be able to include in our definition. And then also, if you have a completely robust definition that describes all of the required um, aspects of an element, then you don't need your software to necessarily know about that particular element if your definition covers it. So you could um, users would be able to write their own elements more um, flexibly. So uh, now there are a few like mathematical preliminaries, starting with the concept of symmetry groups. So we have four main groups that you need to use for generating a basic element. Uh, they're the identity group that just contains the identity, reflection which contains the identity and reflection, um, C3 or S3 quotiented with S2, they've all got lots of names. I, um, I will be using the ones in the first column mostly. Um, the C3 just contains all the rotations of an equilateral triangle, and uh, S3 is all different transformations of the equilateral triangle. And the comment at the bottom there is just that all triangles will be equilateral for simplicity. <laughs> um, then um, we're also going to talk about cell complexes. So we want to describe the cell itself with more information to um, be able to better do that topological association. So we have a, um, a cell complex, which is a set of points, i.e. the different topological entities and the connections between the points, so how those entities are connected together. We would then augment the cell complex with further information on the edges, such as um, members of the symmetry groups to define which way around 
um, the edges are attached to the cell, for example. And then also we'd want to augment immersion operators that define how you take something in a higher dimensional, a uh, lower dimensional entity and put it into a higher dimensional entity. So all of that leads up to the, the new definition, which is, as you can see, fairly similar to Cyrillet's at third sparse, as in it's a triple, where you've got C, V, epsilon, or E. Um, where C is a cell complex instead of just a cell with the immersion and trace operators, as I kind of talked about that, that diagram with the edges. Um, v is exactly the same. And E is another triple that describes how you generate the degrees of freedom using symmetry groups. So we have X, which is a set of generators, so like a subset of your degrees of freedom that are parameterized by a group member that then allows you to transform that degree of freedom into the rest of the degrees of freedom. Then you have the group that you draw G from, the, the symmetry group that you're using. And G2 um, is a transformation group, which defines how once generated, the degrees of freedom will transform the different ways they can be arranged or how many there are. So this is quite confusing without examples. <laughs> no, the computer is alive. <laughs> well, I really should have brought my own. mode again but whatever we'll just there we go okay so starting with the most basic example we're defining dg0 on a vertex you've just got a vertex there's only one possible thing you can do on a vertex which is just evaluate you don't even have a point to evaluate at it's not it's just it's just a zero um not got any dimension at all so your your cell is a point this is the hash diagram You've got the space. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have uh, this tuple for generating, which is just the nothing operator, essentially, is your degree of freedom, the identity group, and the identity group. That's that. Uh, it's pretty trivial, but it's essential to um, include that topological association we were talking about earlier, because you need to go down to the vertex to associate it to the vertex. So this means that your degree of freedom is associated with the vertex, it's gone all the way down to the vertex. So then we move on to CD1, past diagram, a little bit more interesting this time, um, where you've got two vertices and an edge, then uh, your space is normal, and then you have this thing, the immersion operator, which would be drawn from the cell complex, but I haven't bothered um, describing that, um, which builds on the tuple um, for DG0 on the vertex and adds the groups in um, and has a more complicated generator group. You see it's got the reflections, S2. So I looks like this. So um, we expand all of the generate all of the degrees of freedom from the E, which in our case is really simple, it's just there's one. And then we um, trace that onto the different vertices parameterized by B. G. So here um, you've got zero, zero is the base one. So that's one vertex. Then if you apply G, you get the other one. So by parameterizing this by G, you get this projected onto one vertex and then projected onto the other vertex. So yeah. So then when you have the whole set of G, you end up with the two degrees of freedom, one on each vertex. I don't feel like I did a great job of explaining that, but. <laughs> um, and as I kind of implied earlier, the fact that we go down to the vertex in our um, definition associates those degrees of freedom with the vertex. But if we wanted to construct DG1, we wouldn't need to do this. So we just define the degree of freedom directly in the tuple for DG1 and then parameterize it by G. So here you just pick an X depending on how far 
you want your degree of freedom to be, probably um, minus one or whatever, if you just want them on the ends, and um, apply to you directly to that rather than having the whole immersion situation because you're associating it with the edge rather than the vertices. Um, yeah. So now things get a bit more complicated if we want to do something on the triangle. Um, so for example, we're going to go through CG3 fairly speedily. This is the Haas diagram. You've got the vertices, edges, and the cell. Um, and then we're going to build it up using three tuples by entity type. So those associated with the vertices, those associated with the edges, and the one associated with the cell itself. Um, so those are the three highlighted in like light blue are the, um, the generators that we'll use, one for each of these tuples. So, um, yeah, no. So starting with the vertices, we have the generator being the first one in the corner. Our um, generator group is just the rotations. And so we then apply G to that, and it generates the opposite one. And then, yeah, so you get them all the way around. And then moving to the edges, you have this, a similar thing, except, sorry for the diagram jumping, you need to um, go down to the edge level, the interval, reflect them, and then you come back up and then rotate them, if that makes sense, because that's how um, their association works. So then we've reflected them, so we've got the two ones on the edge, and then we rotate them around to have all of them. And finally, you've got the interior up, um, degree of freedom, which is just associated with the cell. There's no complicated immersion operators. You just go straight, it's there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the more complicated example. Uh, this is the kind of summary slide. We're currently testing and refining the definition. Um, I'm going through various elements, trying to write this down, trying to find the holes in where it works, um, where it doesn't work, how can you exactly actually algorithmically do this. Um, they, these are kind of the three main goals going on. Um, one of them is element algebra, making sure we can actually create elements in all the ways that mathematically you can create elements, um, and that the definition that incorporates all of that, and there's rules for how you combine it. Um, we want to be able to explicitly encode orientation, which is what the third um, group in the tuple do that I admitted slightly. Um, and yeah, making sure that we could, that will enable us to imp implement elements that discretize hcurl and hdiv. Um, you can read that. Um, and then finally, I mentioned this one earlier, the machine readable process descriptions function spaces. If you have that, it enables you to save and load meshes much more efficiently and more um, software independent if they can just understand the general definition rather than every visualization of needing to have understood how your element works um, separately. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Thank Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. Probably the next one. Um, how do you adapt to non equilateral triangles if you're using barycentric coordinates? Uh, yeah, well, you just like. Um, can change it and transform. Yeah, this is this is reference space. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, you have to promise that your reference. Um, yes. Yeah, you promise that your reference element is collateral and deal with that in that um, I mean, I think you don't have to, but your life is delayed if you do. I think this. I, I, I do intend to use this um, in various centuries. Well, in, in various centuries, coordinates are trying to use it. Which is in the yeah. I think you can do this on a regular geometry if you really want to, but then you have to. Uh, like your, your group transformations are just yes. And so why would you do that to yourself? Um, <laughs> just, yeah. Thanks for this talk. Um, I'm wondering about tensor product elements, whether they fit nicely. They, they should do. I haven't got there yet, really. Uh, but we kind of talked about them a little bit, but not. I believe the tensor product for that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hopefully there'll be a really nice trick or something. Yeah. Or you, I think you just have to define the things probably the question mark. Is there a way to put the way that function is pushed forward into its... That, that's possible. 
part of our consider we're thinking about that, right? Uh, so there, there will need to be always room, really. and um, that was skimmed over at the beginning. So we talked about the fact that we have to put the trace and the the, the, the right the, the, the trace and the emotion operators. So because we're doing vector characters and not think, the trace and emotion operators will have to somehow be parameterized by something. So I hope it behaves better for you. Like everything else, if we, um, if we did this all in feet, it would be so much simpler than both of those that we have. Um, I mean, yeah, so the other reason that you're kind of. Because uh, when, we, when we did the, um, the uh, <laughs> strangely mapped no. binary elements, like C1 of binary elements, and so on, and the binary uh, triangles, we process and various of Patrick's students have to laboriously work out what all of the transformation matrices are. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you need to know is what the push forward for each functional is and then you can just work it out automatically. Yeah. That's yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 Will this allow us to do so you, you discussed a lot of reference element, but Will this allow us somehow also to do non sort of construction of kind of elements without the reference element? I'm thinking towards something like them or kind of elements that which are defined only in the physical domain rather than on the reference one. That's probably beyond the scope right now. Um, I don't see how those things directly relate to each other. Well, at the end of the day, I can find so all the notion that you are putting there, I will need them on the physical element rather than on the reference one, and so I need to be defined also. But if you're a physical, I mean, either your physical, so if your physical element is the image of something with enough symmetry that this makes sense, mm -hmm. then sure, all you've just done is like your, your physical calculation is just caching the push board, okay. right? Uh, and if that's not true, then no, but then so you know, the, the virtual elements on arbitrary polygons, mm -hmm. I don't think this is going to fix it. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry. Alberto, I think you said the same thing. Yeah, but I'm not So this, in, this should simplify the implementation and just also simplify developing to find the elements that should make it easier to create fancier elements. I don't know yet. In theory, I think I hope so, but we're quite far from that.